Hello there, welcome back to Backyard Ballistics. Today I've got a bit of a wreckage on my bench, so let me explain. The metal part is that of a German K98K rifle, the backbone of the Wehrmacht in World War II. This particular specimen was found by builders while demolishing a house. The wooden stock had apparently completely fallen apart, and they just got rid of it together with the rest of the rubble. So the wood you see here is actually a reenactment, this is just a broken stock I had laying around. The original stock is gone, there's nothing I can do about it, but if you're watching this, it means I've found a solution to the stock problem, so let's go ahead. As usual, let's start with the metal. The magazine and the barreled action are still screwed together, which makes sense considering that the wood fell apart around them. The bolt is stuck, so I used the usual cleaning rod trick to make sure that there was no round in the chamber, which in this case would be particularly obvious considering the size of the ammo. Also, look at the bolt handle. This bolt is neither fully closed nor fully open, but is sitting in the middle position. The gun was actually found with the bolt closed, and my colleague tried opening it to do the safety checks, but I couldn't get it all the way through. Anyway, the surface is not in too bad a condition, and the bore is actually quite good, I'll show it later. Let's try saving these without going for a full refinish. I'm filling my bluing tank with water, lighting the burner, and waiting for the water to boil. I will submerge the whole thing in it and boil it for about half an hour. This is the least aggressive way of removing rust, and the only one that I know of that won't remove bluing as well. Why this thing boils, let me answer a common question. Where do all of these guns come from? Well, after World War II ended, strict gun laws were put in place by governments in Europe, and lots of people didn't feel like giving up the weapons they had gathered to protect their families, so they hid them away, buried in basements or bricked up inside a wall. Today, the same is happening with information. Governments are restricting access to information that doesn't suit them, and while to an extent I can accept a government decide what I cannot do, I won't accept them deciding what I cannot know. That's why I decided to team up with Surfshark VPN. A virtual private network manages your internet traffic in place of your internet provider, which is most likely government controlled and keeps a log of every website you visit. Governments, on the other hand, have no control over VPNs, and the trusty ones like Surfshark use RAM-only servers, which makes it impossible to keep a log of your internet activity. This also means that through the VPN you can access any single bit of information on the internet, no matter if the government tries censoring it. The internet provider won't have a clue which website you're visiting, and the website won't have a clue who you are. Another great feature is that you easily avoid all those annoying geographic limitations. I travel between Italy and the UK, and I hate not being able to access BBC iPlayer when I'm in Italy. With Surfshark, all I have to do is select an English server, and there you go, I can watch Doctor Who. The same reasoning works for most other streaming platforms, so you can access them from anywhere in the world. Getting a 24 months plan makes the VPN very cheap, and on top of that, if you download Surfshark with my link or QR code with promo code BALLISTICS, you'll get 83% off and 3 months and antivirus for free. Corrupt governments are eating away our online privacy and freedom one bit at a time. Make it a tougher meal with Surfshark VPN. Let's get back to our rifle. Look at how much darker the surface got. Also, what is left of the original rust is much weaker, and this assembly should be easy enough now. I'm applying penetrating oil around the bolt, and while I'm waiting for it to suck through, let's look at the screws. This is a very common feature on German guns. What you're looking at is a locking screw. Basically, you have an auxiliary screw that needs to be removed first, before the main screw can start turning. Now, for the bolt, a gentle tap on the handle should be enough to break it free, and I'll soon take care of it. Alright, now that I've partially disassembled it, I can go on to scratch the loose oxides. This reveals a partially blued surface, even in the areas that were mostly rusted, and that is the boiling in water main feature. However, the surface is rough in many of those areas and it's time to take a decision. 
I could either simply do a couple passes of rust bluing to get to the necessary darkness, or I could repolish and refinish from scratch. I would have gone with the first approach, but the owner of the gun, who by the way is my boss, decided otherwise. It is what it is, let's start polishing. I will only do this on the barrel duction, the other parts are fine on their own. Now, let's take the occasion to look at the challenges of refinishing a rifle from scratch. I decided to talk about this halfway through the process, so you can see the gun is already partially sanded. First of all, I could have taken this down further to make the polished job a bit more comfortable, but I didn't. The barrel is screwed into the action, and unscrewing requires a massive amount of torque, which you would have to apply to a very slippery round object. The other bits that I could have removed are the sides, which are braced on. I could have easily removed them with heat and braced them back in place, but then I would have had to realign them, otherwise sighting in would be impossible. This makes the geometry to polish quite complex. The temptation of using power sanding is strong, but so is the risk of screwing everything up with it. With my limited equipment and miserable skills, I would have certainly messed up, cutting corners quite literally. Most of my surfaces are round and I want them to remain that way. The best way of doing that is with a shoe shining type motion. Abrasive cloth is best suited for this job, but I'll show you how to use ordinary sandpaper. The ribbon I'm making is easily torn up when working near corners, which can cause it to break. Luckily, this can be solved with this simple trick. Just fold a bit of the ribbon like that and it'll withstand much more abuse before breaking. This technique allows removing material at a decent rate and keeps surfaces round, provided the workpiece is turned around regularly. Of course, we can't do this in areas where there are markings and German guns are absolutely full of them. They are of historical value and must be preserved. I never go over them with anything coarser than a 240 grit. While doing rougher sanding, I'll have to dodge them. What I usually do is making my own polishing stick using a popsicle stick and cutting a sandpaper strip that is three times as wide. This way I can fold it like this and I'll be able to use it on both sides as well as on the edges for reaching into very tight spaces and concave parts. I normally start with 80 grit, working my way up to 400. At this point the surface looks good, but the finished product wouldn't look right. That has to do with the fact that the sanding marks on the barrel should be lengthwise, not crosswise, so the finishing passes need to be done working parallel to the barrel. Considering this is a military rifle, I go for a satin finish rather than a shiny one, and I'm using some fine scotch bright pad to accomplish this. Now let's quickly look at the bolt. The first thing I need to do is to put the safety on, otherwise I won't be able to take it apart. Mozart-type bolts are easily distinguishable because of their beefy extractor. It's actually more than an extractor, it engages the rim of the cartridge as soon as it leaves the magazine, providing for a very reliable action cycling. The bolt had many safety features ahead of its time, like a third redundant lug and a rear cap that prevented any gas leak to be vented towards the shooter. The long firing pin is the only part of the bolt that wasn't originally blued, all the other ones will have to be re-blued, so let's get ready for that. If you've ever seen any of my other videos, you know I like rust bluing, and in this case there is no real alternative, since hot bluing baths would eat away the solder under the side ramps. Also, with rust bluing I don't have to worry about removing existing bluing. First of all, we need a good rusting solution. I've seen people on YouTube using salt and vinegar, don't do it, it pits the surface and looks bad, it's not worth it. You can simply and cheaply make an excellent solution using just a zinc carbon battery, ammonia and muriatic acid. You're seeing a sped up version of the process here, but you can find all the detailed instructions to make it in the video I'm linking in the top right corner of the screen. I then proceed to swab all the surfaces I need to blue with a small amount of solution. This time I'll wait for the pass to rust naturally in air, since this will show the main advantage of this composition. 
Although not exceptionally quick, it is much more efficient in producing the bluing than any other solution I've tried, which means that just two passes are enough to get a finished bluing. This rusting happened overnight, and the next day I boiled everything for 20 minutes, starting to form our new bluing, which is revealed upon scratching the loose oxides. Look at how we're already close to the finished result. So I applied the second and last pass, waited for a day for the pass to thoroughly rust, and this is the result. If you want to add a bluish reflection to the final result, you can swap the surface with a 0.2% solution of copper sulfate. I'm doing it here, but it's a matter of preference. Now look at the reflections on the finished barrel. They're not perfect, but acceptable. An improper use of power sanding would on the other hand have resulted in all sorts of funny shapes. After brushing the bowl with a bronze brush, this is what is left of it. It's not too bad, there are no dangerous pits or cavities. Rifling is not worn out, the only issue being some corrosion induced roughness, but nothing major. This gun will get back in working order. However, before that can happen, I need to find a stock for it. One of our suppliers had a few original spare stocks, and I bought this one, thanks to my supporters on Patreon. Now, if we look at the markings, the gun has BNZ written on it, and a WAA623 Waffenamt, which both suggest the gun was made by Steyr Dammler Puck in 1941. At that time, stocks for the K98K were made of laminated wood with a capped butt stock. The original stock must have looked very similar to this one. However, this one is unfortunately marked with Waffenamt WAA-135, which means that it was most likely made by Mauser and not by Steyr, but that's an acceptable compromise. I won't do anything drastic to this stock, since it's already in fair condition, but let me give it a little touch-up. First of all, it appears to have been soaking a lot of grease. I'm first removing any excess with steel wool and a bit of brake cleaner, and I want to show you a trick for getting some of it out of the wood pores without having to resort to more aggressive treatments. I'm heating the stock with a hair dryer one piece at a time. By doing this, you can actually see the wood sweating out some oils with the naked eye. At this point, I'm spreading some slaked lime on the surface to absorb the oils. Once I've treated the whole stock, I leave it to rest for about half an hour, and in that time a slimy compound will form on the wood, which is easily scraped off. Once I had scraped the whole surface, I was quite satisfied with the result, and most of the greasy feel had gone. So all I had to do was a light sanding with some scotch bright pad before applying a finish. I wanted to get an end result that was similar to the original look of the rifle, and I thought that Birchwood Case's true oil might have been a good fit. It's a very quick drying oil, suitable for shiny and medium shiny waterproof finishes. I applied three coats overall, four hours apart, and this is the end result, with all the parts ready for reassembly. I'm quite satisfied with the result, especially considering where I started from. The last thing I want to show you is a shooting test and a bit of the gun in the workings. The cartridges were fed directly into the non-removable double stack magazine, either by hand or with the help of a stripper clip, which I didn't have at hand, unfortunately. As I said, the extractor design allows for what is called controlled feed, meaning that the round is engaged by the bolt as soon as it leaves the magazine. 
This prevents jamming in challenging situations, like when the rifle is upside down. Once again, a huge thanks goes to my patrons, which as usual are all listed here. Thank you all for watching, subscribe if you'd like to see more, and I'll see you next time, bye!